Hello everyone. The early years of Gang Greymane's story did not explain a great detail. We do know that his father, King Archibald Greymane, he ruled the Kingdom of Gilneas into a prosperous time, but with the mindset of never asking aid from others. Never take a man's hand, son. It's always better to stand tall on your own. It is what separates the great from the meek. A lesson that his son Gen took to heart as his father eventually passed away and the prince grew into a king. A king with a loving family, his wife Mia, who we first met at the royal at Derek banquet, she gave birth to two children, a son named Liam and a daughter named Tess, but her birth didn't come without complications. She might have actually died soon after being born, but with the aid of Krenan Aranis, the royal alchemist who made the potion, she survived. Although he hardly ever said the words, the king did love his children, he loved his family dearly, as well as his people who meant everything to him. Yet this is Warcraft, and keeping the things you love safe is never easy. The dark portal eventually opened up, the Horde invaded the world and Stormwind quickly fell. Its survivors, led by Anduin Lothar, they fled across the sea to the lands of Lordaeron. As they fled, word of the city's destruction, it spread to the other nations. Lordaeron's ruler, King Terranus Menefil II, was deeply shaken by the news. It had been difficult to separate fact from rumor. At first, the king had not even believed that the orcs were actually real. Now he knew that they were a great threat. When Stormwind survivors finally arrived in Lordaeron, Lothar told Terranus of the Horde's true might. He urged the king to gather the other human nations immediately. Without unity, the Horde would have no difficulty picking off each kingdom one by one. In time, the leaders of all the human nations, they gathered in Lordaeron's capital city. Joining Lothar and Terranus were Lord Admiral Dalen Proudmoor of Calteras, Archmage Antonidas of Dalaran, King Thoras Trollbane of Stromgard, King Aidan Pernod of Alterac, and of course, King Gen Greymane of Gilneas. This moment was called the Council of Seven Nations, with the idea of uniting against his threats, but that all seemed to be a distant dream. Working together like that, it was interesting to some, but people like Pernod and Greymane, they were not so easily convinced. Gen was hesitant to place his people in the line of war, whereas Paranold, he was simply a sly coward. They openly expressed suspicions about whether creatures from another world had invaded at all, believing that there must be some other explanation. As they discussed and debated, the Horde didn't sit still and moved out to conquer more of the world. Soon enough, gnome and dwarf refugees, they also arrived in Lordaeron with dire news. Cas Modan had been conquered, and this turn of events, it shocked the human leaders. The dwarves and the gnomes, they were mighty, and the speed with which the territories had fallen, it defied understanding. What was worse, the Horde was now encroaching north, yet still, Greyman and Paranold, they stubbornly resisted calls for creating the Alliance. They feared that by unifying, they would lose some of the regional power. Divisions widened between the gathered leaders, their arguments grew so fierce that Gilnaes and Altrek threatened to abandon the council altogether. Now in the Chronicles, it's the priest Turellian that steps up, he gives a speech and he motivates them, while Gen's short story, that actually explains a little bit more about what happens during these discussions. With Gen came several of the most influential Gilnean nobles, and mere hours after learning of the Orcus Horde conquering Stormwinds, they discuss what to do next. Lord Darius Crowley believed that they should join the Alliance and do what they can before the monsters tear through the other kingdom's lands and then into their own. He was a smart man, younger than Gen, and a bit less polished in the final points of politics, but many believed that he was a noble with a bright future. Greymane understood his fears, but he wasn't too sure if that plan was the right call. The Orcs had not come near their lands, not a drop of Gilnean blood had been shed. His heart was heavy for what happened to Storm and Avarian, but should they commit their people to a similar fate? Is even one Gilnean life worth sacrificing for a cause that does not affect them? Perhaps his industrious people will be able to do this by themselves. The Orcs, they were just brutes after all, dammy beings, monsters. His father never thought that the future of their people was bound to which way Lordaeron, Stromgard and Altrek leaned. Some are strong and some are weak. It is the way of things and the Gilneans are strong. They had to watch over their own pack first and foremost. But then a measured voice arose from the back. Lord Godfrey, a man less sympathetic than Crowley and more about politics, he believes that they should stay in good graces of the sister kingdoms, ensuring the future trades remain stable. A small token force that would show them what even the slightest addition of the Gilnean military can do, and wouldn't you know it, he was the commander of that force. It was a smart political play, and Godfrey's counsel was trusted by Greymane, but he was always suspicious about his ambitions. Baron Asbury, one of Gen's most trusted friends, they had grown up together, and his father, Lord Asbury I, he had helped Gen's father 
daughter would build the nation up, he backed Godfrey's plan, and so it was that Gilneas did indeed join the alliance of Lordaeron, but they only sent out a token force. Gilneas first and foremost, but they did stand with the alliance, unlike Aiden Paranold of Altrek, who betrayed them all and bargained with the Hordes. This nearly cost them the war, but the Horde also had betrayals from within, which eventually led to the alliance of Lordaeron winning the war and kicking the Horde back all the way to the Dark Portal. Ketgar and the Kid and Tor, they shut down this portal, but they were unable to completely close the rift between their worlds. There was always a chance that the Horde would come back, so they decided to build Nettergard Keep to keep an eye on the area. The orcs that surrendered, they were a bit of a problem and a subject of bitter debate. Gilnais and Stromgard, they argued for the execution of the prisoners, yet Lordaeron was against putting the orcs to the blade. The capacity for mercy, it proved that the Alliance was more civilized and honorable than the Hordes. Rather than execute the orcs, Lordaeron wanted to lock them in internment camps to be funded by members of the Alliance. Dalaran's Kirin Tor also lobbied for imprisonment. The Kirin Tor argued that by better understanding the orc strengths and weaknesses, they would defeat them if war ever broke out again. They eventually came to an agreement where members of the alliance they would fund the construction of internment camps which then would house the orcs. One of Stromgard's most celebrated soldiers, Dan of Trollbane, he would oversee these crew prisoners. Now if order could be maintained then the camps would remain, if not the alliance would revisit executing the orcs. The camps did prove successful but bitterness remained over their existence. Gilnais thought the prisoners were a pointless burden on the alliance. They were already spending a fortune rebuilding Stormwinds, the construction of Nettergard Keep and now more coin was being siphoned into keeping the enemies alive. Greymane was not quiet about this either. He openly complained to young Varian Rin and the other leaders as they inspected the keep, but what price do you place on the safety of your people? It's a very good thing that they invested in this, since the Horde would indeed return for second invasion, but Gilneas didn't play a major part in it. He rose, sacrificed it all to make sure that Azeroth remained safe, but politics and times of relative peace, they caused fractures within the Alliance. A big point of debate, that was Altrek, who had betrayed the Alliance during that first Horde invasion and was placed under martial law. With the war behind them, it was time to decide what to do, Stromgard believing that they had rights to it for their sacrifices and valor during the war. King Terranus, he didn't exactly see it that way. He was still considering adding it to his own kingdom or place someone new on his throne, someone with a sympathetic ear for Lordaeron's causes. Gilneas didn't really have such ties to the lands involved, but still skillfully maneuvered itself into the discussion, not only to raise their own prestige, but perhaps further their own dreams of expansion. Isidon, one of Lord Paranol's nephews, he had fled to Gilneas after the treachery, and rumor had it that Greymane supported his claim as successor. A base in Altrek would give Gilneas access to resources the Southern Kingdom did not have, and an excuse to send its mighty ships across the sea. That in turn would draw Kal Taras into the equation, the marine time nation being very protective of its naval dominance. This situation had the potential to tear the alliance apart, not to mention that the black dragon aspect Deathwing had also showed up. He wanted to weaken the alliance. He pretended to be Lord Prestor, a young noble hailing from the most mountainous, most obscure region of Lordaeron. He claimed to have bloodlines in the royal house of Altrek as well. Claims that he easily supported by using his powers and turning the rulers of the alliance into his willing puppets. He convinced Terranus to suggest him as the next ruler of Altrek, with the other leaders soon enough backing him up. He even figured to strengthen his hold by marrying Kalia Menefil, but thankfully others made sure to defeat Deathwing and the plans that he had as Lord Prestor, they disappeared. Sadly, the cracks amongst the Alliance, they did not vanish so easily. In fact, Greymane decided that he had enough. His advisors had assured him that joining the Alliance, that it would be a boon to their people, but all they had to show for was dead Gilneans, families torn apart by the Orcs, and now the Alliance just kept demanding more and more. Gold for Nettergard Keep, gold for internment camps, gold for rebuilding Stormwinds. They gave the Alliance their support, and as a nation they are poorer, while well, it reaps the benefits of their contributions. Ignoring the fact that the United Alliance was able to protect their world, or perhaps believing that they could do it on their own, Gen Greymane decided to build a wall close the borders and end trade with the rest of the alliance. Insert building a wall and making others pay for a joke here. Now Godfrey, he was one of the first that Greymane told about his plans and he was able to turn, as they say near Booty Bay, lemons into lemonade. The wall would have to cut through a noble's land and by using the mountainous region they could create a secure natural barrier which would make his realm the most strategically valuable as it would be nearest to the wall and their buffer to the outside. Despite the political motives, the plan was solid, yet by building it like this, the wall would have to cut through some of Crowley's lands, something he might not take lightly. They would simply have to make him see reason that this was the best for Gilneas. Anyone can see that it would make an impenetrable barrier. Just imagine how bright their future would be without any interference. 
Oh, there was a future, all right. Just not one as bright as Greyman envisioned it, since outside the borders, the events of Warcraft 3 played out, with the plague spreading across the lands of Lordaeron. Lordaeron asked Gilneas for aid. They begged him to help, but Gen wasn't having it. A heated argument with his son Liam followed, now a teenager, but not afraid to voice his opinion. He was scared and angry and flat out disagreed with his father. What if the plague will reach them? What if those undead creatures get through the wall? What if they could have done something to stop it beforehand? Lord Lordaeron is pleading here, only asking for aid in a most desperate time. They are dying by the moment and they don't request for simple trade, but aid for their people. They are requests of weakness, Gen said. I will not risk the life of my son or any son of Gilneas. My father would not have and neither will his son. Always with grandfather. Always. It is as if you yourself are not king, just some stewards keeping the chair warm until he returns. When I was your age. Gen replied, all I wanted was to be like my father. That is a prince's duty. But Liam thought that a prince's duty was to be a great king. He knew that this argument was lost. His father would do as he always did, and he was right. Gen believed that the wall would protect them. The wall would hold, and Gilneas will always be great. Always. The people of Lordaeron, they begged him for aid, and Gilneas kept his door shut. Weeks later, wave after wave of scourge, a sea of shambling undead bodies, countless arachnid creatures and massive monstrosities whose bodies seemed to be stitched together from the skins of rotted corpses, they assaulted the Great Wall. Their moans echo up while Gilnean soldiers outside the wall, they try to hold the line. There were just too many of them. Even the Great Wall will give against countless numbers. Father, you should have, you should have listened to me. Liam spoke out, but now was not the time. Gen had to show leadership, no matter what. He had to be lord of his pack, Gilnaeus' beating heart, as he wondered what his father would have done at a time like this. There had to be a solution, and one was offered by Archmage Arugal. He had researched the studies of a mage called Ur, studies on the Worgen and their worlds. He describes it as a dark place, a place of nightmare, with the Worgen being ferocious and wicked. It is his hope that no Dalaran wizard ever seeks out the Worgen, for no pact may be struck, no secrets may be learned, no good can come from these beasts. They are best left to their world, for if found in ours and not destroyed, our peril will be dire. The warnings were there, yet all the same, Gen gave Arugal permission to go ahead and at least the worgen against the Scourge. At first, it seemed like the plan was working. They were a force unlike any they'd ever seen, vicious, unyielding, and exactly the beast that they needed to fight the monsters at their gates. But these beasts turned out to be near impossible to control, and when the Scourge was in retreat, the Worgen turned their fury against the Gilneans. That was the day the Greymane closed the gates of Gilneas and never opened them again. Only afterwards did they discover that the wounded soldiers they brought inside the gates, that they were actually cursed. The bite of the Worgen, it would slowly but surely take away the humanity and turn them into Worgen as well. It had come into their protective walls, they were his countrymen, and he was forced to order their deaths. You don't know pain until you've made a decision like that, but no matter how many many affected the day put down, still enough of them escaped. Every full moon, Gen, together with Godfrey, Ashbury, Walden, Marley, and a few other nobles, they hunted in the Black Walls, armed to the teeth, searching for creatures most of their people believed to be myth. The nobles would hunt them down for sport and for vengeance, exterminating the pests that had infiltrated their lands. It was during one of these hunts that Gen got bitten before taking down his prey, but he can't tell the others knowing full well what they would do, what he would do if he was in their shoes, they'd shoot him and prevent the curse from spreading further. So it was that the King of Gilneas kept his worgen curse a secret from all those around him, but this was just the beginning of the trouble for his beloved kingdom. Led by their indomitable king, Gen Greymane, the proud citizens of Gilneas once stood with the Alliance against the vile, orcish horde that sought to conquer all of Lordaeron. Gilneas survived, but in the chaotic years following the Second War, the mighty kingdom drew ever inward. Distrustful of their former allies, the Gilneans erected a mighty wall at the borders of their land, closing off their nation and their hearts from an ever-darkening world. Now, many years later, as the seemingly unstoppable undead scourge marches across Lordaeron, human civilization once again teeters on the brink of destruction. As war and terror close in all around them, the citizens of Gilneas are faced with one terrible truth. Their mighty wall cannot hold back the dead for much longer. And worse, rumors of a new threat have arisen within the kingdom's borders, 
of feral nightmare creatures that walk upright as men, but hunt and howl as wolves. We protected Gilneas from the Scourge. We protected Gilneas during the Northgate Rebellion. We will protect Gilneas from whatever this new threat may be. Turns out, multiple threats at the same time. This is around the Cataclysm period, a bit before the actual Cataclysm shook the world. Outside the walls, we have the Forsaken trying to make the way in, and as we can see, the Worgen roam the streets of Gilneas, but not everyone is aware of their existence. The Northgate Rebellion Liam was talking about, that was a rebellion led by Darius Crowley, who had not taken the wall with grace. He had defied Greymane, and had even aided the Alliance during the Third War by sending the Gilneas Brigade to Jaina Proudmoore. Crowley believed Greymane had abandoned his people, while again, he had tried to reason with the prideful noble. He had tried to make clear that this wall was the way forward. He had tried to explain why assisting the alliance was so very wrong, even if his own son disagreed. But Crowley, he didn't see the truth of it, insisted that he was doing what was best for the future of Gilneas and that he would end Gen's tyranny. Civil war gripped the nation, but Gen was able to hold control and he placed Crowley and his men in prison. Meanwhile, night elves traveled to Gilneas, amongst them priestess Ballista Starbreeze, sensing the wrongness involving the worgen. She's been kept a secret from everyone by Gen, hiding out in his observatory, not even his beloved wife knows, and she used the powers of a loon to help Greymane to help him keep that animal inside under control. But this method won't contain the beast forever. There is a ritual that he could go through, but now is not the time for it. Instead, he has spoken to Master Alchemist Krennan Aranus about seeking a solution through some sort of potion. Starbreeze will offer any aid possible with creating it, but the Forsaken outside the wall, they've risen to a number beyond reckoning. There's murder in the streets, livestock's gone missing, while well, Godfrey, he reminds all of them of the Worgen threats. It's been too long since Greymane joined them on a hunt, and things they've gone quite hard these past few years. Could be that you've grown tired, Majesty. Could be that the years and no war and the endless siege have dulled your edge a bit. None of us would think less of you for taking a brief respite, for leaving the decisions making to someone else for a time. Someone like you, Godfrey. If I didn't need every capable leader right about now, I'd have your treasonous ass chained to a dungeon wall. Now get out of my sight. Treasonous, you say? I shed more rebel blood during the war than you would care to imagine, Majesty. And unlike you, I didn't call the leader of those treacherous bosses my friends before doing so. Get out, Gen tells him as he nearly loses control and transforms. Starbreeze is able to help him out and lets him know that her fears of who's behind these recent events, those fears mean that he will need allies. Greymane had considered to set the events of the war aside and reaching out to Crowley, granting amnesty to his one-time friends. Perhaps he and his rebels will be able to help them out, but what if they can't let bygones be bygones? Those worries are a luxury on the day of the attack, the day the Worgans strike out a mass against Gilneas. Greymane tells his son Liam to place the city on the lockdown, establish a base in Merchant Square, and that is where our Worgen starting adventure begins, right in the middle of the attack. Liam is unable to hold the square against such numbers and orders an evacuation to the prison district where his father's army will be able to protect the civilians. It is time to call in any aid that we can and while Lord Darius Crowley has been called many things, rebel, traitor, terrorist, before the civil war he was called a friend. Greymane never blamed him for leading an insurrection against him. His land and people were separated from Gilneas by a stone wall, but he believes that they had no choice. Regardless, Crowley is exactly the type of person that we need right now, so we're ordered to go to Stoneward Prison and recruit Crowley's aid. Thankfully, Darius is able to let bygones be bygones, and he lets his fellow rebels know that the beasts are back. They don't care about the war or their squabbles. The nobles and their cronies have cursed the name of Darius Crowley for far too long. Your name too, Tobias Miss Mantle, Vincent Hersham. There's a good chance we'll not live to see the next sunrise, but if we die here today, let our names be remembered for different reasons. Let us be written of and spoken of, not as warmongers, but as guardians, protectors, saviors even. We wipe the slate clean and do whatever it takes to preserve life. Rebels are royal and put down as many of these damn mongrels as we can. For Gilneas! We bring the good news back to the king and locate the artillery that the rebels have been able to sneak into the city. Josiah Avery was supposed to be our contact, but the man wants to be left alone. Don't look at him, but it's already too late. 
Yes. He too has been taken by the Worgen curse. And like Gen, we've also been bitten. It's probably nothing, but it sure stings a little. Nothing to worry about, I'm sure. As there is his daughter Lorna, she puts the Worgen down. We inform Greymane that her father's arsenal is at his disposal. All these years after the war, and Crowley was still hiding enough firepower in that cellar to level half of the district. It might have to come to that, but we can't open fire just yet. Not while there are still civilians trapped on the other side of the prism. Not just any civilian either. Alchemist Kren and Aranus is amongst them, so we take Greymane's horse and we rescue him. Well met. Help! Up here! Thank you, I owe you my life. Thank you, I owe you my life. We've got Aranus! Fire at will! The streets were overrun with Worgen, but our cannon fire quickly takes care of them. The bite wound that we suffered is getting worse. We're not feeling too good, but those are worries for later. More and more of the people are turned into the feral Worgen, and we're left with very few choices. What we do next will be a critical decision. If we can make it past the gates into Duskhaven, we'll be safe. The eastern mountains are virtually impassable. We need to keep the Worgen's attention in the city again. It's the only shot we have for the survivors to make it to Duskhaven. I'll stay behind with the Royal Guard, Father. It's my duty to Gilneas. Not a chance, boy. Gilneas is going to need its king's undivided attention. Can't have your father wondering whether his child is alive or not. My men and I will hole up inside the Light Storm Cathedral. I've already given the order and the cannons are on their way. Lead our people well again. We were fools to take up arms against each other, Darius. The Worgen would have never stood a chance. As Gen, Liam, and the rest of the people evacuate the Duskhaven, Crowley and his rebellion, they draw the attention of the Worgen and make their stand at Light's Dawn Cathedral. Lorna is informed by Liam what has happened, and she is ready to blow Gen's brains out. You gave him a taste of freedom, only to turn around and feed him to those things? How could you? Was it not enough to lock him away, separate him from his family? Is this your final revenge then? But Gen never meant for this to happen. His heart breaks for his old friends, but we help out Crowley with his suicide mission. Let's round up as many of them as we can. Every worgen chasing us is one less worgen chasing the survivors. You'll never catch us, you blasted mongrels! We had enough ammunition to carry on the civil war for another month, yet the worgen numbers are such that we're nearly spent. We do not want to be cut out here in the open when that actually happens. It's time to fall back inside the cathedral, use the choke points, and kill any mud that comes for us. In the meantime, our wound has gotten quite hideous. The skin around it is black and blue, there also appears to be thick hair growing around the edge of it. After taking out a fair few of the worgen inside, they simply stop coming, and no, that is not a good thing. shall find out next week, as that is when we're going to continue the storyline, find out the history of the Worgen Curse, the connection to the Night Elves, rediscovering our humanity, and so much more. For now, thank you very much for watching everyone, subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!